Hello, welcome everybody. Can everybody hear me all right? This is our third general meeting. Welcome everybody. Glad to see new faces and some people I recognize. So today's general agenda is pretty similar to last week's, but this time instead of a quote, I'm going to be presenting an opportunity for everybody here to attend to, and then we'll have our regular presentations. And I will also go over my internship from this summer with Carlos Diaz. So this is the opportunity I'm presenting to y'all. It's a Valero Career Fair happening next Wednesday, September 28th. So if you guys can scan that QR code, you can register to attend this event. So if anybody's looking for careers or internships, right, feel free to attend. They'll be here on campus from 9 to 1 p.m. I think it's a great opportunity to network or, like I mentioned, get, get that experience you need. Let me know if that QR code doesn't work, though. I know it's a little terrible, but um, I could send the link as well on our social media. Thumbs up, good, everything's good. And now for everyone's favorite part, some outperforming moments for the week. Who's got an outperforming moment they'd like to share with us? Yes. Got a contract about the market update for 2022 for Dallas Fort Worth for um, all types of places. Nice, congratulations. That's a great opportunity. Great opportunity there for you. Anybody else? Another outperforming moment. Mm -hmm. No, I'm mean, they're either there or there is, but let's give the members here an opportunity. So, okay. Yes, I mean, Career fair today, and um, handed out my resume and made some good contacts. Nice, that's great. Great opportunity in July. Perfect. Okay, let's continue here. Oh, one more. <laughs> uh, I got a undergraduate researcher internship with the NASA organization doing data analysis for the Mars Insight Rover. Nice. Hopefully we'll get more of them next week. So I'll continue here with our agenda. I want to give a quick empty shout out to Waylon because he was present for all um, of our tabling events, if anything, the last two weeks, two weeks ago. So quick shout out to Waylon and a round of applause. Thank you, Waylon. So our club too loud, it turned off, but okay. Um, let's just leave it at that. Y'all can still see on this one, right? Okay. Okay, perfect. So now for the internship spotlight, which is Carlos and I, who interned at UTIMCO this summer, so congrats for me joining up here. We're going to be chatting a little bit about our amazing experience at UTIMCO. And for those who don't know, UTIMCO is basically the endowment fund here for the UT University system in Texas, right? And AM. So, let's you get it. It. yeah, let's, let's get so started it's here. It's yeah. Hmm. So, uh, summer 2022, uh, Carlos and I both. Got, a, got chosen to intern right with Timco. And this slide here basically covers a lot of the experience we had and certain projects we were entailed to do for the past summer. So I'll talk about the first two here. Um, we worked on an energy transition paper all together with all interns. And that's a little difficult when there's like 15 total interns. So communication was important, but the way we divided this amongst the intern was different sectors and areas for the energy transition space. So I in particular worked specifically on researching the carbon markets and this entailed um, doing readings and um, conducting manager calls to see what UTEMCO's managers are doing for this space and as well as researching on the California cap and trade market that's viewed as the golden standard now. And Carlos, his part for this paper was on energy ETFs, and I'm not sure if you want to chat a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. yeah. Hey guys, uh, so my name is Carlos. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. Um, that's okay. Um, I'm a senior here at UTSA, born and raised in Washington, D.C. If you're familiar with the area, you're closer to Bethesda, Maryland. But um, yeah, so Anna and I were selected to continue our, um, well, it actually started um, last year, right? Yeah, it started last year with a scholars program. So actually, it's um, was it? it was you, me, and 
Jason, um, all three of us actually were handpicked to um, work with Utemco with basically what their goal is they take people who I guess are, they take Pell Grant recipients on, or um, they don't have direct connections in the industry. And we spent three months getting to know the industry a bit better. Um, they had people from various industries, whether it be VC, private, public, hedge funds come in and speak to the crowd. Um, and this was all the UT schools. There was five from UTSA, Tyler, uh, Permian Basin, El Paso, so on and so forth. But we were selected to continue our internship. And yes, yeah, so my presentation um, or my role at UTEMCO was again working on the energy transition, but mine was closely uh, related to ETFs, more specifically clean market ETFs. So you'll have um, your obviously iClean, iClean being the largest ETF in that space. So why were we doing this? Well, obviously, as many of you know, ESG is such a big player now in the industry. BlackRock is really pushing ESG, and a lot of companies really need to have their ESG scores high um, for multitudes of reasons, but primarily, obviously, you want your high ESG just so you can have good loans, good um, scores, so on and so forth. Everybody has their opinions on that. I know a lot of people tend to have their opinions on that. For us, really had his shares on that one. Um, but then also continuing on, we had all hands presentation. A lot of companies actually have this. It's just a monthly report. Um, Twitter actually had one a couple of months back when Musk was buying Twitter and there was some um, controversy on that. But yeah, it's a monthly presentation goes over internal performance, external performance, um, outstanding moments similar to this. And then obviously um, manager calls. So my role with that project was also leading calls. So I led a call with BlackRock. I'm pretty sure JP Morgan, but I can't recall. But it was BlackRock number one because obviously the largest player in that space. And then Anna and I also worked side by side on a hedge fund project, which I'm sure you can talk a little bit more about. Yeah, for sure. So for the hedge fund project that we got assigned to, actually, um, let me speak a little bit on on how the internship was um, separated, I suppose. Oh. So 15 interns, I went up the first week, we had to talk amongst the, our coworkers and like project managers to see which project we really want to do. So they presented us with like eight different opportunities of what we really want to focus on, what we're interested in on. And Carlos knew nothing about hedge funds, neither did I. So we decided to test and challenge ourselves by uh, selecting this project. So here, we learned specifically about Utemco's current stable value portfolio on the hedge fund side. So we learned their different strategies and we had to conduct, uh, we had to create a hedge fund primer essentially for the team themselves and also just um, present all that information in a visible and clear manner. Um, yeah. Oh, clear manner. Yeah. So onto the next slide here. I wanted to talk a little bit about the actual, like a little type vlog of the day in my life as an intern at Utimco. Have any, how, how many of y'all have already had Like y'all know what that day's like, full time, working, waking up um, and everything. I woke up generally six to 7 a.m. between those intervals, right? And then uh, we would generally start our day with an HR type check-in. This did happen weekly, so it wasn't every day. So in that HR check-in, we would meet with all interns together with HR, right? We would discuss what we're currently doing, any challenges that we're facing or questions amongst UTEMCO's like community culture and stuff like that. And then in usually every other day, we would have at least one or two manager meetings that we can attend or conduct, like I mentioned, for certain projects. So I think I met with BlackRock a few times, uh, PIMCO, JP once, I think. And I think Carlos spoke to- Yeah, the one, was it Two Sigma? Was yeah. It, it was like Two Sigma, pretty sure we had D Shaw um, and Fortress. There's a lot of players. I mean, the, the name can go on, but Truth Be Told, the Tempo has a lot of connections to a lot of big players in the industry. And for various reasons, did you post that article here in this thing? Okay. Well, anyway, there's a Bloomberg article that came out about like a week ago, which actually I highly recommend all of you take a look at. Um, that really just states that the UT system's on track to surpass Harvard in wealth. So a lot of you may know that the UT system gets a lot of their funding from the oils in the West Texas lands. So that makes us uh, really attractive to investors. Um, so that's something we have that Harvard doesn't. 
So there's an article out there that showcases that as of right now, we're on track to um, beat Harvard. But um, that isn't to say that Harvard is a competitor. Well, they kind of are, but Utemco and Harvard have a lot of uh, similarities in who they hire. A lot of the people who work at Utemco used to work at Harvard and vice versa. A lot of the endowments are closely intertwined. Whose project was that? Carl's project? Yeah. So one of the other interns, Carl, which he goes to a &M. Yeah, he goes to AM, um, great guy, who was also a scholar who went to an intern, um, did a project that actually showcased how the other endowments, how they uh, manage their funds. But anyway, back to this, um, I was going off track. Yeah, so this is kind of similar how my life kind of panned out. Truth be told, there were some times where I woke up late. I was staying out of BK and I was speeding down those roads. Um, I even got a ticket in Westlake, so that was nice. But yeah, so we'd be check-ins with HR and the whole intern team that you would attend a whole bunch of meetings. Um, sometimes it was meetings, sometimes it was working on Excel. Um, and then typically around then it'd be lunch. You'd have, our Anna was in charge of portfolio updates. We had a, uh, was a weekly market performance update. Shocker, all of us in the intern group did awful. Um, but as to be expected, the markets right now aren't in everybody's favor. Then we would also meet with our mentors. Her mentor is actually pretty cool. She's the, the managing director for the public equities team um, and current boss. Um, and then we actually, or I guess, I don't know how it happened. I truth be told, I was just kind of lucky working one day. The CEO, Mr. Britt Harris, kind of just tapped me on the shoulder and asked me for lunch or for dinner. Um, and since Anna's such a great friend, kind of wanted to extend the offer. So we actually shared dinner with uh, probably one of the coolest people I've ever met. Um, Mr. CEO Britt Harris, who has been the CEO of Bridgewater for a couple months, and he was also was it Verizon's investment management company, CEO of uh, Verizon's investment management company, also CIO of TRS. Yeah, he was a CIO of TRS, which is the Teachers Retirement System of Texas, um, which is twice the size of the tempo, believe it or not. It's up there with your CalPERS and your other big endowments. Um, and then obviously gym time. Truth be told, um, I was in the gym a lot more. Anna can't even do a single dip. So, okay. you know, she wasn't, she wasn't prioritizing. And in this photo, I think here's got a lot of stuff value. So if anybody here is a car person, I'm a really big car guy. That gentleman in the background, he's the managing director for the fixed assets. His name is Russ Campy, and he's been at Utenco since its founding in 1991. Oh, no, sounds about right. We'll say 90. Anyway, he's been there since birth. And um, he's probably one of the coolest people I've ever met. Really big Porsche guy, really big Bonds guy. And he has two Porsches, a Cayman and a 997, 911 Turbo. So he got the, let me take a spin in the Turbo. And then the CIO currently, Mr. Um, Rich Hall, let me take a spin in his Porsche Tiger. Um, there's also a lot of crazy things that happen in the internship, but I can go on and go on. But I guess. All right. Yeah. So I actually wanted to talk about my, not me, but the, my setup, my little setup there. Um, that was where we were at for the most time of the day. Um, so all interns shared like these two huge office spaces. They sat like 10 people in each one, but we would like separate and go to different locations. But that's my little setup there. Um, they gave us free coffee, free drinks all the time. Not drinks, um, Cokes and stuff. Um, <laughs> Book sprites. Um, so we would generally do that a lot. Um, we all interns had like a little hangout here and there at our little the break room, the break room where, where everything was at. And um, through the intern portfolio that I managed, because uh, I volunteered, um, I learned a lot of my Bloomberg skills through there. I developed them a little further. And then at the end of the internship, I did a whole like allocation analysis and stuff um, as to who the real drivers were because one of our interns was like last place oh, yeah. for half of the, the summer. And then at the very end, he ended up winning the competition, which shocked everybody. So I wanted to explain what happened um, with the earnings there. And now to the last slide here, real quick to wrap things up. Some of the key takeaways. Um, the, on your right side, you can see the five Fs that our CEO and like everybody there at Utempo would pretty much push a lot. So it's faith, family, finances, friends, and fitness. And these are like, sometimes the yeah, they can be interchangeable, depend on, on priorities, I want to call them, but these are pretty critical and always have a picture and have them in mind um, throughout your day here. 
And there's also photos attached to the slide of all the interns. Me and Carlos were all UTSA interns, of course, and half of them were UT and half of them were AM. So you see, we were a diverse group there. That's true. Yeah, so we had UT Tyler, UT El Paso. We had a few more other scholars, uh, past scholars that were there. And some other key takeaways I would throw out there is that this is my first in person internship. So I was really scared. Like the first day, I showed up very professional looking, fixed my hair full on, um, nervous for the day, right? But really, Utempo was very caring and understanding, and I really liked their culture. They made everyone feel important, right? Like, outstanding, everybody. But um, I walked in there not really knowing too much, not what, not knowing what to expect. And I think I left there with great experience and knowledge now. Not only that Utempo is a great place, but that I can surely um, grow my strengths further and learn some more. Especially from that energy transition paper, I really liked talking about the carbon markets and exploring that side because, like Carla said, gives you very important now, right? And also, um, I challenged myself on this particular paper because I took the hardest part in the carbon market section. And since I did com the compliance carbon credits part of it, so it was mandatory for companies to do certain stuff. I'll pass it over to Carla. Kind of under the photo on the right actually was our first day. So we took this on our first day of internship, which was May 31st. And then the one right above me, one right above me, um, was probably the cool, one of the coolest days. Um, this was right before we got into a board meeting. So I don't know if any of you have ever been in a board meeting. The board meetings are A, super boring, but they're also, uh, I guess, one of the coolest places you can see where the big decisions are made. You know, these are people who you know, oversee the CEO and make sure the decisions that are being met align with Utemco's uh, morals. So um, he was, but currently stepping down, chairman of the board. I don't know if the name Jeffrey Hildebrand may, rings a bell to any of you. Um, he's current, or he was CEO of Hillcorp. He's since retired, quote unquote. But CEO founder of Hillcorp, which is the largest privately held energy company out of Houston. He's also the seventh richest Texan with a net worth, I want to say, of 70 billion. So that's higher than Trump's, believe it or not. Um, got to meet him, pretty cool guy, shook his hand, complimented his watch, but I don't know him personally, so don't reach out and ask for that network. Um, but yeah, no, it's great. It was a great experience. I really learned a lot. Like Anna, this was my first ever internship. So I didn't know what to take out of it. Uh, I learned very quickly, hedge funds are not for me. That's something that is very, very difficult to do. And if I told you some of the strategies you typically uses to um, generate returns, you'd be kind of surprised, one of which includes investing into uh, litigation. So believe it or not, there's people out there who invest into the outcome of a lawsuit. Um, and that's how some of you are here today. So uh, Utemco is unique. It's definitely one of the coolest places I will ever be working at. And um, some of those people I'm still keeping in touch with today and interns and people who work there. I've met a lot of great people and um, people I will cherish for the rest of my life. But I think that's all, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Let me know if you have any questions. Yes. We'll be here after the meeting. If y'all are interested, also you tempt those internship applications should be open. I'll pass it to Juan Carlos now. What's up, everyone? To start off, we'll have a market recap for the last week. Then we'll talk about FedEx. We'll talk about gold, AutoZone, port, and market reaction to the Fed fight today. Today, to start off, this was uh, the past five trading days. Obviously, after the CPI report came in, we all know uh, for CPI was 6.3%, up 4% from July. And obviously, we already know that the Fed hiked 75 basis points, but at the time, CME Group said there was a 76% possibility of that happening. And a lot of news came in last week, uh, basically talking down on markets. Goldman Sachs they were, said they were planning on to cut jobs, and General Electric said supply chain issues are still here and affecting earnings. Now, it is important to consider that at the beginning of all the rate hikes, companies of the big, the most of the companies that were firing people and laying people off were tech companies. And now it is expanding to banks too. And here, columnist from the Wall Street Journal, James McIntosh, uh, in context, he was talking about inflation, said investors have been far too optimistic that it will happen soon, that it will come down soon. 
In the face of a lot of evidence that inflation is stuck well above the Fed's 2% target and clear warnings from the Fed that the market has it wrong. Now let's talk about FedEx. Last Friday, shares of FedEx dropped 21%, raising 10 billion in market cap. It marked the company's biggest one-day drop ever. FedEx warned of a sharp, unexpected slowdown in the macroeconomic view. Also for context, uh, FedEx was only giving a guidance for their earnings. Their earnings are coming, uh, I think, tomorrow. But uh, this was only a guidance, so the guidance made this happen. Global shipping volumes declined rapidly. Asia and the US had lower volume, while Europe faced logistical obstacles. FedEx announced it would aggressively cut costs by closing offices and parking aircrafts to offset lower revenues. Additionally, FedEx attributes lower than expected earnings on macro issues outside of their control. The fact that they were talking about uh, issues outside of their control, more macro, was, a, was another thing that triggered markets. So the warning had a massive effect on uh, the broader market, triggering a sell-off. Obviously, the S&P was down, uh, I think, like 2.5%, 3% that day, and then it kind of rebounded. But all the major indexes were hit really hard. And then uh, a Deutsche Bank analyst said FedEx pre-announced the weakest set of results we've seen relative to expectations in our 20 years of analyzing companies. What this means is basically uh, FedEx gave a, an outlook of what they think their earnings are going to be for the next earnings, for the next quarter, for the next few months. And they said that it was the uh, worst uh, guidance I've ever seen. Now let's talk about gold. Gold is considered by many investors a hedge against inflation and turmoil. For instance, on February 24, Russia invaded Ukraine, as we all know. As an effect, over the next two weeks, gold was up 12.51%. And where the arrow is, uh, was the day uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. However, inflation has only increased since the beginning of the year, and gold has gone down. Gold is down 8% this year. Now, this is a great chart. It basically has a comparison of the S&P 500 versus gold each year in their uh, yearly return. So first we have 2002, the dot-com bubble. The S&P was down, I don't know how many percentage points, but gold was up. The financial crisis, again, the S&P was down while gold was slightly up. The Japan earthquake, another turmoil in the world. Uh, gold was up while the S&P was kind of up. Monetary policy, timing of monetary policy was one I didn't know, but in 2013, uh, the Fed came up with the monetary policy and they were tightening it, and that's uh, a way that gold is also affected. That's uh, one thing I didn't know, but now you know. And at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, gold did really well, and the S&P obviously rebounded really quick in 2020, but gold also did good. Now, why are uh, investors not buying gold? Investors looking for a safe place for equities are also buying treasuries. And this is another good, uh, the next point is a really good one. Another alternative for a safer, less volatile investment has been the US currency. So the US currency has been appreciating against other currencies worldwide. And uh, overseas buyers that normally would buy gold have stopped buying gold. And uh, just because uh, it has become more expensive. And then Taiwan senior trader, the rose precious metals in New York said, the outlook for gold remains vulnerable until the Fed stops hiking rates. And that goes back to the tightening of monetary policy. And then analysis at JP Morgan gave gold a price target of 1650 by the end of the year, which is less than the price of 1680. Now, not all is bad. AutoZone had a great uh, quarter, so let's talk about it. On Monday, AutoZone reported its Q4 performance. It had sales of 5.35 billion, up 10% from a year earlier, beating both EPS and revenue forecasts. But how? More workers returned to office fueling car repairs. The rising prices of new cars drove consumers to stay with their cars longer. This increased sales for car parts, repairs, and maintenance. And AutoZone raised prices to offset transportation, labor, and raw material costs, helping increase sales by 11% in the quarter. So kind of this point is a big point in why AutoZone did really well. First of all, people were not buying new cars, so a lot of people in terms of volume uh, were doing more car repairs and maintenance. And then adding the fact that they increased prices, well, it was a great quarter for AutoZone. Now, let's talk about Ford. Ford stock had its worst one day performance in 11 years, dropping 12.3% at Tuesday's close. Ford gave a sneak peek on Q3 performance and warned investors of 1 billion in unexpected supplier costs. This is similar to the FedEx thing that we're giving a guidance. The supplier issues were affecting about 50,000 vehicles who weren't sent to dealerships. What happened? Do I continue? Okay, perfecto. 
Okay, this is what it gets interesting for context. Ford was projecting quarterly profits of around 3 billion. In the announcement, they give an estimate of 1.5 billion. So basically they were slashing earnings by 50%, which is obviously not good. And now also the same day this happened, CNBC interviewed General Motors CEO, Mary Barra. And uh, she was basically saying that uh, supply chain issues had been missing and they were finding efficiencies to overcome supply chain issues. And uh, that's another thing that uh, has been happening. Apparently uh, supply chain issues have been missing for all the industry, all, all companies. So they wanted to talk to you, obviously the competition to see if it's also happening to them and they said not. Now market reaction to Fed high. The Federal Reserve today increased interest rates by 75 basis points to 3.25% and gave guidance for additional hikes in the future. And obviously this was uh, during uh, federal uh, chair, Jerome Powell's speech and the markets were super volatile. Bank of America changed their terminal target rate to 475 to 5%, which means they think uh, the Fed will stop hiking rates until it gets to 5%. Now this is a performance of the three indexes in the last five days. And one of the most interesting ones the S&P is uh, year to date back down 21%, which means we are in bear market territory again. According to Charles Schwab, market, uh, bear markets are defined as periods with cumulative declines of at least 20% from the previous close. And it was actually during the summer when we hit 3,600 and we were down 20%. So we're back down to 20%. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask at the end of the presentation. Or at the end of the meeting. Now, we come to the third slide. Yeah, Juan Carlos. All right, we're getting to the economy. Uh, so, first, I'm just going to go over just this interesting little fun, fun fact. Uh, so, this is the market performance in the first half of 2022, which was actually the worst stock market performance in 50 years, so since 1970. Um, so as you can see, almost every sector besides energy was down. Was down. Right, we have consumer discretionary down negative 33%. Consumer communication services down negative 30%. Um, you can see the rest, right? So everything was down, right? Just ter terrible, terrible. We had a little rebound, but now we're back down in the bear market, as Juan Carlos said. All right, let's get into bonds. Um, so what is a bond? So bond is issue like... Corporations and governments will issue bonds uh, to use that money to invest in, invest in different things or fund their day-to-day -day activities, right? So it's an alternative to issuing stock for, for companies. Uh, so it's essentially a loan. Um, so I'm gonna give this, this issuer my money and in return, I expect a, uh, a coupon, right? So I expect a, a compensation for this, uh, for this loan that I'm giving them, right? And so there's, there's bond prices, right? So they're really, they issue the price at a fair value or par value, which is usually issued in, in uh, denominations of 100. Um, so it can be 100, 200, 300, 1,000, 2,000. Um, and so that's going to be a maturity value as well. So the prices can fluctuate in the market, in the secondary market, because of external, external factors that go on in the market, um, such as you know, rising interest rates or um, supply and demand, right? So... The coupons or the coupon rate, especially the interest rate on the bond, um, and that's going to be tied to the par value. So it's not going to be tied uh, to the price fluctuation, price fluctuations uh, of the bond. So let's say uh, the bond gets issued at a par value of hundred dollars, and it's a three percent interest rate or three percent coupon rate. It's going to have a coupon of three dollars. And so let's say you know very next day um, the bond goes the bond goes down to um, eighty dollars now. It's still going to earn three dollars and uh, as a coupon, right? So that's that's going to lead to the yield. So the yield is where it takes into the account like the uh, the change in prices compared to the market value or the, the maturity value of the bond. Um, so you can ca calculate the yield in two different ways. Um, the simplest way is the current yield. I uh, just divide the coupon uh, divided by the price, the current price, and so that doesn't take into account the uh, difference between the maturity value. Uh, and the current price. Um, and there's yield to maturity, which is you calculate that the, the way you calculate the internal rate of return or the IRR. Um, so that takes into account the, the adjustments of the uh, difference between the, um, 
maturity value in the price, right? So this is an example. So say today, you know, we have a market rate, which is the interest rate, the federal funds rate is 3%, uh, and the bond is paying 3% as well. Um, and the face value is gonna be $1,000. So the maturity is 10 years. Um, so this coupon, so this bond is paying 3% on $1,000, which is um, $30, right? So the, the bond will be paying $30. The price is $30. So someone buys it for $30, I mean, for, for $1,000. Um, and the use of the yield to maturity is also 3%. Now let's say one year later, the market goes to, the market rate is 2% now. Uh, the coupon rate is still gonna be at 3%. Okay. The coupon rate is still gonna be at 3%. Um, and the face value is still gonna be at $1,000, right? So they're still earning $30, uh, no matter you know, if the interest rate goes, goes up or down. Um, so, this, so being that the interest rate goes down, this bond because it pays higher than what the market is currently offering. Um, so. As you go down, as as the as the as the investors start to buy this bond, the price of the bond is going to increase. So that'll eventually uh, decrease the yield back down to two percent or near two percent, um, which will, will be will, which will match what the market rate is offering. Right? That's an example. So, so understanding yields. Um, so yields yields move inversely to prices. Right. So what that means is when bond prices go up, the yields are going to fall. When bond prices fall, the yields are going to go up. So, in simplest terms, you know what this means is if I if this bond is paying a ten dollar coupon and I buy it at eighty dollars, um, it's the market price eighty dollars. I'm earning a 12.5 percent yield. Um, let's say the same bond the very next day uh, goes up to hundred, which is, is unrealistic. The prices don't move that quickly. Um, but let's just say for this example, they do. So you still the bond is still paying a ten dollar coupon. Now it's at $100, and I'm only making a 10% yield. So the increase in price makes the yields fall. I'm going to wait for that. Okay. Um, so now prices fluctuate for several different reasons, right? So there's monetary policy. So when Fed changes the interest rates, increases or decreases the interest rates, uh, as well as supply and demand. So um, there's also different other changes such as Bond, bonds, rate, bonds rating changes or the issue credit rating changes, um, which is, are smaller uh, reasons why the, why the bond prices will fluctuate. The main two reasons are going to be the monetary policy and supply and demand. Um, so the picture on the right shows you that you know we have several different uh, treasuries. So the, the three months, six months, and 12 months of the treasuries below one year uh, or less than a year, they mature in less than a year, they're called T-bills. And the ones that mature over a year are called just you know, treasury securities. And as you can see here, the yield on the two years at 3.96%, uh, and the yield on the 10 year is at 3.56%. Uh, so can anyone tell me what that means? When the two, when the two year is, is yield is greater than the 10 year yield. Inverted. Yep, it's inverted. The price goes huh? The, no, so that, mean, that means the, the price is going down, the yield is increasing. But what I'm trying to get at, yeah, it's inverted. Um, so what does an inverted yield curve mean? Now, how does the yield curve work, right? So a normal yield curve uh, is when long-term long maturities, uh, the, your yields are higher than short-term maturities. So it's a picture, that is how it should look. It's a little steep because I had to fit it in the frame, but that's how it should look. The longer-term maturities in the very right, the 30 year, 10 years, 10, 20 years, should have higher yields than the shorter term maturities. Um, and right now, as you can see, uh, the yield curve is inverted, right? So the short term maturities are hot, their yields are higher than the long term maturities. Um, so during a normal, during when the normal, when, when the yield curve is normal, uh, investors are expecting higher inflation. Um, so they're gonna invest in, uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna sell their bonds and invest in the stock market because it provides a higher return. Right? So they, they don't want to be in bonds when inflation is eating away at their coupon. Um, so they sell it, the yield goes up. Um, and so an in inverted yield curve, you know, investors start to buy these bonds because 
there's currently you know, economic downturn, maybe uh, interest rates are rising. So you know, the stock market, is, stock market is not doing that well. So they want to go into safety. They start buying these long-term treasuries. All right, so the yield curve inverting is a recession indicator, right? So that's what, that's what most investors use uh, as an indicator and also the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell uses as well. So he uses the 10 year minus the two year treasury yield curve. Um, and that pred has predicted the past eight recessions. Uh, so this is a year, is a year's worth of, uh, of, of the, of the uh, 10 year minus the two year. So you can see we are currently at you know, near negative 0.45%. Um, 10 years at 3.526%. This was taken, you cannot see, it's right. Okay, uh, 10 years at 3.526%, at the two year at 4%, the one year at 4%, and the six months at 3.9%. So obviously inverted the short-term treasuries, uh, you know, have a higher yield than the long-term treasury. No, so a recession is just an indicator. It indicates that there is, uh, there's likely going to be a recession. Uh, it doesn't mean that there is, it just means that we're likely going to see a recession, right? So this is where I'm going to get into this chart. Um, this chart is you know, a longer time frame. As you can see, after each inversion, the, the gray spots are recessions. So after each inversion, um, there is usually a recession afterwards, right? except for uh, 2020, because no one could have, could have predicted COVID. But you know, for, for all the other dates, there's usually you know, a recession after the inversion. So the Fed rate hike, you know, the FOMC met today. They raised their, they raised the federal funds rate by 75 basis points. So now it's at it's going to be near three percent and uh, to 3.25 um, percent. As you can see in the chart, this is there's no really there's no correlation to it. But you know, after each Fed rate hike, um, there is, there's there is a recession after as, as well. So you see 1990 Fed rate hike happens, starts to decrease recession. 2000, Federate hike happens, start to decrease, recession. 2009, Federate hike, rate hike happens, start to decrease, recession. So you can see it's kind of a little, uh, little um, thing going on there between the between, uh, Federate hike uh, cycles and recessions. Um, so summary of economic projections came out as well. And that's just um, what Fed's releases and what they expect interest rates will be at from one year to three years out. So interest rates, interest rates will be at um, all, as well as inflation, GDP, unemployment rates. So they really saw that. And they said that they expect interest rates to be at four, near 4.5% in the next year. So what does rising interest rates do to the markets? So the real estate market, um, you got to, it affects the real estate market because the mortgage rates start to increase, right? So right now we have an average mortgage rate of, at 6.25%, which is the, since the first time since 2008. Um, so, you know, not a good sign, right? 2008 wasn't a good year. Um, as you can see, you have the mortgage lending by volume in the picture shows that, that you know, mortgage lending has dropped you know, dramatically since you know, 2021. Um, and it's come back to kind of normal, normal times, which um, was not, is not good for the mortgage industry because they, they did a lot of hiring because of this boom. And so now they're laying off uh, a lot of people in the mortgage industry, right? So mortgage applications are near all time lows as well. Uh, so rising interest rates also affects stock markets. Because um, investors expect you know, future earnings of, of businesses to be lower uh, because the increased cost of capital for businesses, they cannot, you know, it costs more for them to, to borrow and invest in their companies. Um, and so they start to sell these and just invest in bonds because uh, it's safer and less risky, right? So this also strengthens the dollar, right? When interest rates go up, gets rid of inflation, helps get rid of inflation um, and strengthens the dollar. It strengthens the dollar, uh, makes the dollar more attractive to investors. Right, so in foreign investors to start investing in, the, in uh, into the into this, into the bonds. I'm sorry, it's not seeing. So yeah, foreign investors start investing into bonds, and they will 
uh, that would that will decrease the yields on the bonds and increase the prices and prices. So that's going to keep that that'll help keep the, the yields on, on the ten years lower than than the short term treasuries, right? Uh, it also affects import and exports, right? So if if we're exporting, um, it's good for us or it's bad for us. I'm sorry, for exporting is bad for us because now uh, foreign foreign investors or foreign buyers, governments, uh, different individuals, it's now more expensive to buy goods from us, right? So importing, it's better, right? It's cheaper to buy goods, it's cheaper to cheaper to go to Europe now. You can now go to Europe and, and splurge a little bit more. It's not as expensive, um, which is which is good. But you know that doesn't help GDP, right? So net exports, uh, GDP is going to go, you know, or net exports is going to go more negative than what it already is. All right, that's that's it for me. If you have any questions, come out to me. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good week. So we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Uh, so last semester, we had a uh, M&A deal that was Spirit and Frontier combining. Uh, this was announced on February 7th. Uh, they were going to create the fifth largest airline and a $6.6 .6 billion deal. Some of the deal built, uh, details are uh, $2.66 billion in shares for the Spirit owners. So they would become a, a bigger company and they would get 48.5% of the total new company. And they would also get $239 million in cash, which is roughly $2.9 billion uh, total compensation for the full amount of Spirit, uh, which was about a 19% premium on the uh, share price. So then about a month later, uh, on April 5th, Frontier's uh, offer had lost some value. And so uh, since it was a lot of uh, shares of their company and then just some cash, uh, the value had actually decreased from about 2.9 billion to about 2.8 billion. So it lost about hundred million or uh, three and a half percent. And unexpectedly, JetBlue made an unsolicited offer uh, to purchase uh, Spirit uh, for 3.6 billion in cash, which is about $33 per share or 33% more value than uh, uh, Frontier offered. So what do you guys think the Spirit Board decided to choose? Wrong. They declined JetBlue's offer uh, because they, well, next slide goes into that. Uh, so uh, why did they decline the offer? Uh, so unlike the compelling, never mind. Uh, unlike the compelling uh, Spirit Frontier offer, the combination of an acquisition with uh, JetBlue would have a high fare carrier that would lead to more expensive travel for customers, uh, which is going to raise the eye of the government who don't want more expensive uh, flights right now as inflation's an issue. And uh, also in particular, uh, they discussed how JetBlue had just purchased American Airlines. Uh, and so that merger was already having issues uh, legally and so uh, they gave a couple more options, but basically said they thought the Department of Justice would not uh, accept the uh, acquisition from JetBlue of Spirit. And so JetBlue's CEO, Robin Hayes, responded with uh, Spirit shareholders would be better off with the certainty of substantial cash premium, uh, regulatory commitments, uh, reverse breakup protection. What, and then it said Frontier's transaction has a similar uh, regulatory profile to ours, but offers no divesture commitment and no reverse breakup, while the uncertain value of Frontier's stock exposes spirit shareholders to significant risk, which is correct as the deal kept going on. Uh, Frontier's stock kept going down, and so it kept becoming worth less and so uh, what did JetBlue do after they got uh, rejected? They make a third hostile offer uh, appealing directly to shareholders uh, saying to vote against the Frontiers uh, merger so then you can uh, be acquired by JetBlue. And so what does... Uh, 
Spirit do in response. They got the ISS, which is a uh, the Institutional Shareholder Services. It's a uh, ad advisory firm to come out and say that the Spirit uh, Frontier deal was a better deal or the JetBlue deal was a better deal, but they should take the Spirit Frontier deal because it was more likely to happen, which is what the board had said the whole time. And so uh, you have some final offers that are made. Frontier Airlines final offer is uh, 2.4 billion in total cash and stock uh, and a $350 million if the deal is broken up. Uh, it's majority stock and some cash. And then JetBlue had uh, 3.8 billion in cash, so quite a bit more, 400 million if the deal is broken up and a 10 cent uh, per share ticker uh, after December, 2023, uh, I think it was for like a dollar 50. So about 15 months of if the deal doesn't go through uh, additional money. So what is a, a very good explanation of this and what the shareholders are looking at? Essentially, you have Frontier and uh, Spirits board essentially have their deal already. And the, the shareholders, you know, there's more money. There's uh, more, uh, it's just, a, it's, it's a better deal financially. And so the spirit shareholders, uh, they, they like the other deal. And so on July 27th, uh, after delaying the vote twice, the spirit board finally calls off the merger with uh, Frontier as they just don't have the votes. Uh, the shareholders, they would rather have uh, the other deal with uh, JetBlue and they go ahead and do that deal the next day. And so uh, as the spirit uh, board members had said there was gonna be regulatory issues, they're already having it. Uh, Senator Warren uh, urged the Department of Transportation to block the deal and uh, don't have to go through courts or anything because it's part of the Department of Transportation and the way airlines are, they can just uh, say the deal can't go through. So if the deal happens to go through, uh, you're gonna have the regulatory battles in 2023 and then it gets approved. And then in 2024, they're gonna have to retrofit all of the spirit planes to the JetBlue style, which is why the Frontier deal was a little bit more conventional because they wouldn't have to change the planes at all. Uh, but JetBlue deal is the one that ended up getting voted on. And so by 2025, we would have the completed integration of Spirit uh, planes into JetBlue and Spirit would no longer exist. You would have uh, the nicer economy seats and the, uh, the better mint suites uh, on the planes. So uh, while JetBlue and Spirit got the deal they wanted, or JetBlue got the deal it wanted with the Spirit, Spirit, Spirit shareholders. Uh, Frontier thinks that it might be Southwest in the 1980s after this. With decreased competition, uh, the CEO said, we're in a situation where 95% of the capacity in the United States is going to have a cost that is a third or higher than ours. I don't think it's been that good since Southwest in the, 19, in the 1980s. Uh, Barry Biffle, the CEO of Frontier, said that. And then here is a breakdown of the ultra low cost uh, carrier market share. You can see Spirit has 50%. So if Spirit's gone, then Frontiers can come in and take a lot more of that market share. And so they're also going to have an increased fleet, even though they aren't getting the Spirit planes, they do have some planes on order. So from the 114 planes they have currently in 2029, they should have 272 planes. So here are my citations. Uh, please follow me on LinkedIn. Question. question. So, Frontier stock plummeting. What if JetBlue was like, just kidding, now we're going to buy Frontier for this kind of price? Are they allowed to do that? If Frontier's shareholders and board were willing to sell. You think they would? I don't think so. But, I mean, clearly they wanted spirit more. And what about losing this to more? Yes, and well, that would be saying that they would buy Frontier instead of Spirit. Oh, okay. I, I don't, they, they don't have the financial capacity to buy both. 
So, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll give the mic to Anna. Hey. Y'all know the drill to sign in, right? Um, sign in if you're in person. You can still sign in if you're in Zoom. But for the gift card, you have to be in person. And I'll give it a few minutes here, but we will be presenting. It's Oh, it's already done. Let's see the site first because it may run out of time. Can the people on Zoom still see the screen? Okay. Great. All right. So we're a little low on time. So I thought I would show this so you can't see it. You might want to take a picture of that, but um, all right. So we've got 14 classes and sectors lined up. This may not be the final schedule, but we're hoping that it is. So Waylon, to kick us off Tuesday, September something. Uh, I don't know what day today is. 21st, 2019, 27th. So the 27th, Waylon will have his Tableau class at one o'clock. Larissa will do technology at 5.30, so we have one sector. And then Wednesday, we have a bunch of classes on Wednesday, starting at 1.30 with the sector. You see we have sector teams, they have two people, so we can divide up the work a little bit better. A fact exam review, Matthew's gonna handle that. Andrew's gonna do his very popular commercial real estate class again, and then follow that up with the real estate sector. Victor is gonna do blockchain in crypto. He's going to tell you if 19,000 is a good price or not, maybe. Or not. Um, Carlos and Anna are going to do a really tough sector, but very interesting. And let's see how they break it up because healthcare, you can break between services and pharma and equipment. So we'll see how they break that up. And then semiconductors. So we're going to break semiconductors out of tech, which makes a lot of sense. Brian and Wayland are going to tackle that. An Excel class. Uh, Kanan's going to do that. He's going to focus on those Excel things that you need for interviews. So you got to make sure you know how to do pivot tables and be lookups and those kind of things. Um, then energy sector, Anthony's in my secret analysis class. He's doing energy stocks. So he's going to get some kind of extra boom for his paper, plus help you see what he's doing with, with his stock. I'm going to do a wealth management. Just if you have no clue what to do, where to start, uh, we'll make it really, really basic there. And then um, I came up with this title for Collins. He may not like this title, but we'll see. But some applied statistics, throwing a little bit of Python in there. And then we'll end up with our final, final sector, consumer discretionary. So we're going to do some Friday classes. We've done, we haven't done Friday in a while. Anna did a Friday last semester and she had really good attendance. And We've had great attendance on Fridays. So I thought instead of doing Mondays, which almost no one comes to, we'll try Fridays and see. So take pictures of that. Um, I'm probably out of time. So yeah, let me stop there. I'll do my growth versus value next week. So I wanna make sure any, everybody got a picture of it. We'll put this on the doors by Tuesday. So you'll see it. And then we'll probably put it out there on Telegraph and whatever else we have. Uh -huh. All right, thanks. Out of a class for speed. So I highly recommend these sectors and classes. Um, let's rush this so we can get out here in time. Is everybody good with the QR code? Everybody sign in? Perfect. Um, some society updates. We're gonna have our social here real quick to give you guys an update. This is just your question. All right, I hope you guys are excited for game night on Monday. So like Thomas said last week, we will have Scribbly IO. I know that's probably gonna be like one of my favorite games because everybody's just talking like, what is it? I know, I think last time we had a B, we had to guess so that was pretty obvious. And of course, you know, little, little among us there. And um, for the bottom two games, either League of Valorant, um, for sure, uh, put it out on Discord. If you would like to play like a certain game, it could either be um, on Monday, September 26th on 7 p.m. or it could be another time. Thank you, Juan.
So I hope to see y'all on Discord for this social event we're gonna have going on. And a reminder, the Market Watch competition is live. These are the current rankings as of like two, three hours ago when I updated this. But um, I'm now really low. I thought I was up there. Um, so I don't have any profits yet, but they'll change. The market's always changing. So um, so yeah, there's there's a quick update. Feel free to join. It's on our link tree and our socials. If not, just ask me. And once again, the t-shirt design competition. So these were officially supposed to be due emailed by tonight, but I decided to extend the deadline for this Friday because I have a few more that are interested and just in time to create a design. What exactly are we looking for on these t-shirts? We want these t-shirts to, you know, represent us professionally uh, about the investment society, we have our little keywords out there that are on our logo so you can put out form, value, and grow. And then the colors that we're leaning towards too are black, white, and gold. You would prefer you use those colors, but I mean, up to y'all, it is a competition for whoever has a prettier design, um, best looking. So we'll vote on these, hopefully the next general meeting. So be there to vote and also like pre-order uh, the shirts. And I think we're selling polos right after this meeting ends as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 25 regular price. If you're a member already paid your dues, it'll be 20. And now for the good stuff with the gift card. If our treasurer is ready here to announce the winners, you ready? Okay, give him some time. Give him like 10 seconds here. Um, but once again, before we head out, we'll announce the winners and feel free to scan the link tree there. That's going to update you on all our social media platforms you've got going on. And the Market Watch competition link is on there as well, as well as our website link. And on the website, you can pay your dues through the website. And if I'm not mistaken, it's like on the top right corner, the join us button, you just press that. Select the plan you want. If you want to pay one or two semesters, I recommend buying two semesters because it's just $35. So that's for that. Are you? Okay, great. We have our winners. Yeah, I'll give it to Jason. Okay, so apologize for the little inconvenience. Um, so our first winner is Brian Adams. Oh yeah, all the way up there. So at, after the meeting, come down and just uh, give us your email and set up. All right, last one. All right, hopefully it's good luck. Sebastian Hastings, hopefully. That. There you go. Give it a hand, give it a hand. All right, so um, I'm gonna pass it back to Anna to conclude this meeting. Um, for everyone, uh, come down after the meeting and we'll go ahead and catch up. All right, everybody have a good night. I'll let you all Thank you for coming. See you all in the next meeting.